Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Yesterday we had uh, in our program uh, one keynote speech by Prof. Hillary, two interesting panel discussions related to uh, health. We had around 20 presentations in all the prior sessions. Our today's program will be as follows. In the morning session, we have one keynote address and one panel discussion. Engineer Aisha Abdouli, in her keynote address, she will talk about the innovation journey in Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. This session will be moderated by Ms. Naseem Abdullah, Head of Section at Dubai Municipality. After uh, uh, Ms. A uh, Engineer Aisha, keynote at this, we will uh, be in a panel discussion, there will be a panel discussion organized by MediClinic. The title of this panel is Improving Lifestyle Quality through Healthcare Innovation and Holistic Approach. The moderator of this panel is Bohari Aida, Dean of the School of Health and Environmental Studies. After lunch, we will continue as usual we will continue our running workshop on COVID social responsibility. And at the same time, we are expecting 12 presentations today on two bioelectric sessions. One session for health and another session for environment. Uh, I wish you a happy, fruitful day. After these sessions, we will have a closing ceremony. Uh, after the morning session and before the lunch, we will, uh, we will have the closing ceremony. Please keep updated by downloading and following our interactive mobile app. Should you need any help, please don't hesitate to contact me or any one of our organizing committee members. Thank you uh, very much. Have a wonderful and nice day. I'm calling upon uh, Ms. Nassim to join me on the stage to introduce our keynote speaker for today. Thank you, Dr. Matel. Uh, engineer Ashir Abdouli, Chief Innovation Officer, Director of Environmental Education and Awareness, UAE, Ministry of Climate Change and uh, Environment. Engineer Aisha has over 15 years of experience in different fields, such as the green development, sustainable development, and green economy. In addition to her skills in developing policies, strategies, and regulatory frameworks in air quality, climate change, adaptation, and waste, and chemical management. She currently takes the role of both Director of Environmental Awareness and Education and Director of Air Quality in the Ministry. In addition to her role as Chief Innovation Officer since March 2016. At the Ministry, which is uh, formerly known Minister of Environment and Water. Engineer Aisha is also responsible for developing national strategies and as well coordinating uh, implementation of programs for enhancing environmental awareness and air quality in the country. As a director for green development at the ministry, Engineer Aisha was responsible for developing national green development policies and regulatory frameworks for transformation to green economy and also develop the necessary policies for the private sector contribution in green development. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Engineer Aisha to the stage. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Martaz and Nassim, for the introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm extremely delighted to be here today, and I extend my sincere thanks and appreciation for uh, Sheikh Hamdan bin Mohammed Mark University for inviting me to speak at the annual Congress of Innovation Arabia. Uh, the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment 
had developed an integrated and comprehensive innovation strategy, which includes four main pillars and supported by three pioneering initiatives. These efforts aim to develop the and raise UAE's global competitiveness, rate in environmental areas, reduce operational costs, and ensure customer happiness in a unique way of pioneering and efficiency at the same time. Our strategy was based on clear scientific approach to support the development of the creative ideas and help to turn them into future projects and provide added value on the services and products uh, offered in line with UAE Vision 2021, which aims at achieving sustainable development in environmental, economic, and social aspects by involving customers, partners and employees and the, help and the whole community in the innovation strategy. Our strategy had a prioritized major goal and uh, we're striving to achieve them. Uh, this includes developing a simplified system for innovation management at the ministry and through the identification and distribution of a specific roles on employees uh, intensifying efforts to improve the quality of services and products, providing a stimulating work environment uh, to encourage the generation of creative and innovative ideas. This could be achieved by utilizing integrated scientific tools and setting up a special roadmap to prioritize continuous improvement as well as working on developing a simplified mechanism to link the ministry innovation strategy with innovation tools so as to activate the implementation process with efficiency and effectiveness to ensure achieving our goal. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the main guidelines in developing our innovation strategy stated that innovation is based on institutional efforts, national policy, and the specialized staff. Innovation also represents the cornerstone of the global competitiveness. And it's not specified to a certain grade or a certain individual or employee. Innovation for everyone. This was one of our main key success factors in developing our innovation strategy. Make sure when you are uh, developing your innovation strategies at your organization to involve everyone. Don't miss anyone. Open the channel and let everyone be, you know, on board with you in developing your innovation. The four main pillars of our strategy was in establishing stimulating institutional environment and supportive legislation and transforming government innovation into institutional work and encouraging the private sector for more innovation and attracting, glo attracting global leading, leading companies, as well as rehabilitating and motivating individuals and building high innovation skills by enabling talent and capabilities. I'm going to play a short video which share with you our journey at the Ministry of Climate Change and environment. But before that, let me share with you a very important outcome that came out of a very important study that had been conducted, which was the readiness of innovation at our ministry. That readiness study that was conducted by Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Innova Government Innovation Center in 2015 aimed to actually measure and analyze and assess what is the readiness and maturity of the innovation in every government entity? So that study was, show, was uh, actually conducted through an electronic survey that was circulated to all of the employees in the government uh, entity and uh, assessing the uh, readiness based on eight main aspects. Our score at the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment was 5.9, and it was, sorry, it was 6.4, and it was above the government average of 5.9. Uh, the study uh, had really 
helped us in analyzing or identifying what are the weakness points that we need to improve, what are the opportunities that we have to build on, and how can we develop our strategy further. So, uh, based on the outcomes from the strategy, we had or we were capable of analyzing our internal environment and external environment. And according to that, we focused, we, it was like a kind of a campus to allow us to focus where we can improve more. So, from the internal uh, environment analysis, we knew that we need to focus more on spreading innovation culture, urging the adoption of innovation tools, setting up an electronic system to receive the staff and customers' suggestions, providing general education among workers on innovation and the tools to generate ideas. Because many of the employees, many of the workers thought that innovation is something that needs to be done by a very specialized person. You know, the people who are coming like from, uh, we, we, call, we, 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 we used to call them like the nerd people, you know, they are like the very smart people sitting in the corner, no one is going to them, and those are the generator of the ideas. No, it's not like that. Every one of us has the potential and has the capability actually to come up with an innovative idea. So we started to raise awareness, we started to build the capacity of our workers, not only the employees, even from the leadership, from the supervisors, from, you know, the specialists, you know, going till the fresh graduate employees who joined us. So we have designed uh, uh, several programs, training programs. We conducted, you know, several workshops, and even the workshop itself, we did not conduct them in a way like, uh, okay, you have to sit and we have to talk. No, it was a kind of like an interactive workshop that was done in very innovative way where we actually engage the audience with us, the employees, the leaders, you know, and make them work actually on implementing one of the innovation tools and finding a certain solution or an innovative solution for a challenge or a problem that we are facing. So, in addition to that, that study also uh, helped us in addressing what are uh, the external opportunities that we need to build on. And that was, you know, like we need to increase our global interest in investing in the innovation sector, to raise the community knowledge and interest in the sector, to launch the policy leadership of a group of initiatives to support initiative innovation, such as the National Innovation Strategy and the fourth generation of the excellence system and the federal government of UAE, and the provision of advanced application to manage creativity and innovation. So the general framework of our strategy and approach was based on consolidating a culture of innovation in the institutional work environment and the commitment of organizational units actually to, to apply uh, creative ideas and to provide the necessary financial and the human resources to spread creativity culture. Maybe you are aware that we are in the federal government uh, has been, you know, requested to allocate 1% of our budget for innovation. So we do have that 1% of our budget on yearly basis allocated for funding and uh, uh, funding uh, innovative projects and research as well. Uh, finally, to achieve our strategic goal of instilling innovation culture in the institutional work environment, as I mentioned at the beginning, we had launched like a three uh, major initiatives. The first one was building the capacity of the staff in the field of innovation. The second one was adapting the latest tools and means of innovation within the institution. And the last one was enhancing the processes in order to promote, promote, uh, to promote innovation. Now let me uh, conclude with uh, the following four minutes video. I hope that it would not be a boring one, but it's a kind of like, I try to summarize what we did in two years in this four minutes video. 
So I, I hope that you would like it, and it will give you a kind of, I would say, a glimpse of our innovation journey at the Ministry of the Climate Change and Environment. And I would like to thank you really for your listening and for being with us here today. Thank you very much, and enjoy the watching. is an everyday practice. It's, I hope that you enjoyed it, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Engineer Aisha, for your inspiring speech. Now it's the time for any 
uh, questions? Anyone? Any questions? Angina Aisha is here. Anyone? Yes, of course. There is no questions means that I was not so interesting. So please ask me some questions. Okay. Uh, I have uh, a suggestion and advice, not question. Okay. Thank you for, for this nice presentation. Uh, my uh, suggestion that uh, as long as you are encouraging innovation, okay, I have a suggestion for you. Uh, if you organize a competition for students and uh, university and uh, even postgraduate students uh, for best uh, environmental research proposal, uh, uh, then you will receive like 10, 20, uh, 30 proposals per year from different universities, okay, maybe for environmental students who are seeking some kind of support in their research. And uh, if you have a jury of members to judge and evaluate this proposal and see the feasibility and alignment of this proposal with the uh, uh, ministry, uh, in this case, the winning proposal can be funded by the ministry. It can be like up to a certain amount of money. And in this case, you can get like a good quality research done by students in UAE, supervised by the university, and that at the same time you are sharing and supporting your research agenda and solving some of your problems. So I think this is a suggestion. If you take this to the ministry and if each ministry here, not only in the environment, each ministry, if they conduct this kind of, of, of supporting student research postgraduate, it will solve a lot of problems for the funding process for universities and at the same time it will link the industry with the academy through the learner who are the product of our learning process. This is the suggestion. The advice, I'm going to establish or I'm working with my colleague Dr. Mayara and other colleagues in Hamdan bin Muhammad Smart University to establish a center for green economy. I'm environmentalist, I don't have good background in economy what I have noticed now that the country here, uh, you are focusing on carbon emissions and energy technologies related uh, and all of the funds going to this direction, reducing emissions, uh, carbon emissions mainly and uh, uh, energy technologies or low cost energy technologies. I think the scope of green economy beyond these two limited points, okay, so if we are going to establish this center, what kind of advice you can give to me as a stakeholder, because you're a stakeholder in this process, for this center to be a unique, innovative, and add to this country? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Martel, for your suggestion and for your advice. Let me first uh, address your suggestion. It's a very good suggestion, and really we are looking forward to and very keen of getting or establishing such an award for environmental research. And let me just give you, a, you know, a small brief about that. As uh, since last year, we had established at our ministry uh, a scientific uh, committee. It's called UAE Committee for uh, Academic Research in uh, Sustainable Development, sorry, in Climate Change and Environment. That committee is chaired by His Excellency Dr. Sani al Bayoudi, uh, our uh, Minister for Climate Change and Environment. And uh, the membership of that committee is coming, you know, from all of, uh, I would say, the prestigious and uh, universities uh, in, within, uh, within uh, UAE, whether they are international or national universities. I'm not sure if Hamdan bin Mohammed is one of them, but if not, then they can join uh, this committee because this committee is meeting on a regular basis with our minister and with the concerned departments from uh, the ministry to actually discuss about the point that you have mentioned, how we can utilize and I would say drive the academic research toward you know, addressing the government needs. Today the government needs to work very closely with the academia. We cannot work in a you know, separate uh, planet, I would say. We need to work together and increase our collaboration because our needs need to be, you know, uh, studied and researched by our students. So 
Today we do have master's students, PhD students, and also the bachelor's students. It's better from now that we uh, um, built the platform for them that, yes, those are the challenges that we are facing. Those are our needs. So can you please help us, academia, to address those by, you know, your research and by your scientific approach? So that will be a win-win situation for everyone. But I would really would like to discuss this further with you, Dr. Mataz, and, uh, you know, with uh, Hamdan bin Muhammad University as well. And as I mentioned, through also our uh, academic committee, we can do a lot of things. Already many things have been really moved rapidly since that committee has been established, and I'm sure that we can build on that momentum. This is, sure. Uh, this is the, your suggestion. Regarding your advice, uh, let me also, uh, I don't want to talk too much, but let me also give you some brief about that aspect. UAE, I would say, is uh, the first or one of the pioneering countries in adapting green economy. When Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, by the President, uh, Prime Minister, Vice President, and ruler of Dubai, had launched in 2012 UAE uh, Green Growth Strategy, that was launched in January 2012. And then in July 2012, Rio Plus 20 had adopted the green economy as one of the tools in achieving sustainable development. So we are really proud as a country to be one of the pioneering countries actually who had really, who had adopted this approach even before the whole world is considering this approach as a very potential tool in achieving sustainable development. So from that time, we've been, you know, we had developed actually an action plan that we called it Green Agenda 2015-2030 for UAE. That Green Agenda was, alhamdulillah, approved by our cabinet in 2015. And from that time, we had worked intensively in actually implementing the programs which had been listed in the Green Agenda 2015-2030. National committees had been formed also a national council for following up the implementation of the Green Agenda at four. But then after the restructure in 2016, that council was replaced by what has been established now and it's called UAE Climate Change and Environment Council. So that council is looking after all of the uh, environmental aspects, including the implementation of Green Agenda for UAE. Uh, I would also advise you, Dr. Matas, and the audience to, you know, visit our uh, website, uh, www.moca.gov.ae. In that website, you will find three releases, uh, sorry, two releases of our State of the Green Economy report. We were among, I would say, and I'm really proud of that, to, you know, uh, be among the first countries in the world actually to have a state, a national State of the Green Economy report. And even that report, the first one, was acknowledged by the United Nations Environmental Program, and it was, you know, um, published on their website as, a, I would say, a knowledge project for the other countries to utilize it. So I was really proud to be, you know, the one who had developed that report with my team. And uh, then we had also developed the second edition of it, and now the third edition is almost in its final stage, and inshallah we are going to launch it uh, very, within this year as the third edition of the State of the Green Economy. The importance of that report, Dr. Matas, is the uh, information that are listed in it, you know, because we have developed, uh, I would say, a toolkit of 41 key performance indicators that are measuring our transformation to green economy. Those indicators are in social side, in uh, economic side, and environmental side. So I would really advise you to go through it because, now coming to your advice, your center or the center that is going to be uh, launched within the university can really work on implementing some of those uh, programs listed within the Green Agenda, which are in the field of academic research, because there is one main uh, pillar of, the, of our green agenda, which is, uh, you know, having um, 
a diversified economy which is based on uh, knowledge, a knowledge diversified economy. So that you will see that a lot of things related to academic research and uh, many things that the academia can do. So I, I'm sure that you will find, you know, a lot of areas where you can work on uh, in this report. So I hope that I have give you a good advice. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Jabir here. I'm an innovation expert. The question was, are you moving towards uh, open innovation in the near future, or what's the plan for that? Sorry, say it again. I couldn't. Are you moving towards open innovation? Towards what? Open innovation. What do you mean by open innovation? Open innovation means that you allow ideas coming from outside the organization from the world to uh, to solve the challenges that uh, Mocas has? Well, of course, that is actually it's not if we are moving toward this, we are actually implementing this. Uh, already the, the doors are open for the engagement with everyone from the community, from private sector, from academia and from the stakeholders, the government stakeholders to actually share with us their ideas and their, you know, proposals for a certain challenge or problem that they see. If they found that, for example, or they think that they do have a solution for that, uh, we are welcoming, you know, to receive that and to work with them in implementing the solution. Um. Thank you, Engineer Aisha, for your excellent presentation. I've never seen uh, government uh, um, organization slide, uh, video slide as professionally developed and educative as that. So, congrats. Um, I'm interested in your perspectives on innovation culture. Um, in the health sector, we have big problems or big challenges. Um, progressing on inculcating a culture of innovation. And from your publications and some of the things you've mentioned, uh, it appears that you are actually doing better than most. So I'd like to learn from you on how to um, develop an innovation culture within organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. And, uh, I totally agree with you that it's not easy to build an innovation culture. And I'm not saying that we are, you know, uh, our culture within the ministry is like a kind of like a hundred percent or a super culture for innovation. Still, we do have, you know, some challenges and some obstacles that we need to address. The most important thing is actually to engage the employees, you know, to give them the confidence and the trust that they can come up with any idea. Because what we noticed in the past, that some of the employees were a bit afraid or hesitating actually from approaching their managers or the leadership and bringing or coming with ideas. And that afraid or hesitation was due to, for example, the uh, idea of like, okay, I'm going to say it and it, it will be rejected or it will not be accepted and maybe it will be a kind of like sometimes an extra burden on another department, so why should I involve myself for it? Another thing was, you know, the incentives. When you are giving them incentives also for uh, bringing ideas that will help a lot and encouraging people. And incentives not necessarily to be financial incentives, you know, any type of like, any kind I would say of acknowledgement by the leadership or, you know, even if it is a small incentive, it will make a lot of change for the employees themselves to encourage them. A third thing was actually to raise their awareness because as I mentioned, many of them were, doesn't know what does innovation mean. They thought that it's something like we have to create it from the scratch. It's not. Innovation is any improvement that you are doing to a certain process or to a current process that you have. The way that you improve it, it will really consider to be an innovative way. If you are like, for example, by implementing this modification or this improvement, you will save some time or you will save some resources or you will improve the efficiency or the effectiveness of that process. So there are, you know, very simple things that we had tested with our employees and implemented, and we, we found the results. So I would say the key success factor for enhancing 
innovation, first of all, to build the capacity within the team, to uh, give them the trust and the confidence that, yes, your ideas are welcome and it will be taken in consideration. And the first thing is to, you know, make them or uh, open the door for innovative tools and improvement to your processes to come. Uh, this, from my experience, this would be, I would say, the three main things that we had focused on. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Engineer Aisha. Just, I just wanted to address that we do have uh, attendees virtually as well. And if there are any questions, please let me know so that we can attend to the virtual respondents as well. Okay? Let me know, please. Thank you. We have one question. Uh, thank you, uh, Engineer Aisha, for this informative uh, presentation. Uh, I have uh, one comment that, uh, and one question. My co uh, first comment that about, uh, I see that. Uh, uh, that most of innovation strategies in in uh, MOOC UAE, which is uh, mostly uh, focused in internal way, you know, in, uh, away from external. Even for uh, external inputs, we see that uh, you mentioned that about international international experiences. But when uh, you uh, when you when you uh, present the, uh, the statistics, it's only 10 to 8 uh, tables or tips. Uh, another question I have that. Uh, one of the inputs you, uh, for innovations uh, in, in our, uh, this organization, you mentioned about for, uh, fourth generation of, uh, of, uh, of uh, UAA government excellence. Uh, but I think this, uh, this can be considered as evaluation for uh, 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 as, as a government entity's excellence. How, how this uh, in it, how this uh, that for this four uh, generation of government uh, extra system can be used as inputs for innovation in this organization. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, questions. The first one, I, I believe it was regard, related to the international trips, if I got you in the right way. And actually, uh, the statistics here that I showed was like 10 trips in 2015 and 80 trips in 2016. It's not, uh, it's not uh, a small number of trips. I would consider them that really like you, you are doing like two trips per quarter to an international to abroad, you know, to going abroad to see a certain experience. I would say that this is really uh, a good and acceptable average of a trips because otherwise then we will spend our time traveling around the world and we will not have time to, you know, focus on other things. So I would say uh, from our experience that eight to ten trucks per year, that is, I would consider too much even, you know, for to, to do. Usually it has to be, and our target was like one trip per quarter, which, are, which is like four, four trips per year. So that is the first point. The second point, when I spoke about the fourth generation of the government excellence, uh, the fourth generation has been amended in a way that it includes a main pillar or a main criteria for assessment that was on innovation and future foresight. So if you, <coughs> if you saw the, the, uh, the grades uh, of the, the, the three pillars that are there, one of them was, for example, the vision, the second one was like the processes that you are implemented, which you will be assessed on, and the third pillar, which is the 20%, out of the 100% is going for innovation and future foresight, with 15% for innovation and 5% for future foresight. So that is the 20% of your total score as an organization will be assessed according to uh, how far you are going or how strong and how mature you are in adapting innovation a strategy and not only a strategy but also actual projects how innovation has already contributed to improve your processes, your services, your projects, and everything you are doing. So we want act why it's been included in the fourth generation business excellence because, or the government excellence, sorry, because we want to reach to a stage where the federal government or the government entities are not doing innovation as if it is um, something extra I would like to do. No, it's not anymore the case. It is. It should be actually like a kind of a business as usual. It's a routine thing that you are doing your work in innovation. So we are trying to reach a stage 
where the innovation would be, you know, injected in the DNA of all, all of the employees, actually. So this was why it's been actually inserted as the main criteria, 20% weight in the excellence, uh, the government excellence, to encourage all of the government entities that you have to do it, and you wouldn't be, you, it's not anymore a kind of a choice or an, an option for you. Did I answer your question? Thank you, Engineer Aisha. I really like the way you said it, like it's embedded in the system, and this is, I think, we are looking for it. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, good morning. My name is Kifah. I am a PhD candidate at uh, Hamdan bin Mohammed uh, Smart uh, University. Uh, actually, I'm working in a uh, healthcare organization in government sector in uh, UAE. And uh, when we speak about uh, the green incentives and uh, the green practices that should be Im implemented, yesterday we were having a presentation, one of the keynotes, it was about uh, health in all policies. And we spoke about the need also for environment in all policies. So I can see that uh, uh, in healthcare, we are still like left a little bit behind to think about uh, uh, adopting the green practices inside healthcare. So don't you agree with me that um, uh, environment sector is a little bit detached from uh, uh, the health sector, although we are health and environment, we're supposed to go almost together. This is number one. Number two, can you, for example, tell me about from your expertise, if there is any uh, practices that uh, can be adopted by healthcare to start introducing the idea of green practices in the system. Because to, to be a green uh, organization, you should start with the basics or just to start to help the people to understand. I'll, I'll give you just one example, then I'm closing. For me, in the unit where I am working, it took me more than six months to send letters up and down, up and down to request one recycling bin for papers because I was getting irritated to just see how much we are throwing papers and it is not recycled. So just to get that one, it took me that uh, long time. And thank you very much. It was very interesting. <laughs> thank you very much, Kifah, for your questions. And uh, re regarding the first point, which is uh, the synergy, I would say, between environment and health. Uh, the synergy is there because, you know, environment cannot be without health and health is not without environment. Actually, the environment is affecting our health. So that's why we do have environmental health uh, programs and environmental health, you know, activities going on. Even uh, just last week, uh, the ministers of health and environment for the Arab countries had met together, you know, uh, to a... Uh, to, to approve a, a strategy for the whole Arab countries, uh, which is, you know, uh, focusing on the synergy between the health and the environment. Uh, a lot of our activities in the environment field, or I would say in the life and in the industry, is affecting our environment, and accordingly, our health as people is affected. And uh, one of the major points, I would say, the air quality because the air quality is, you know, uh, affecting uh, or the health is affected by the, uh, the quality of the air that we are breathing. And that's why, you know, now we have a mega or I would say uh, uh, a bigger project that's going with Mustard Institute for the surveillance of air quality utilizing the satellite plus developing uh, a numerical model for actually assessing what was our air quality like 15 years ago and what will be the air quality in, let's say, in the next 15 years, so a kind of like a for, uh, forecasting, and how is that affecting the health? So we had started already, I'm um, going behind the schedule, or we, we had started already talks with the Ministry of Health, the uh, Health Authority in Abu Dhabi, in Dubai, and other uh, in, uh, Emirates, to actually to have this linkage between the uh, health records that are uh, or the patients that had been admitted to the hospital with due to some you know asthma problems or some respiratory uh, problems and 
the air quality at that time, so that we, we, we find this relation between them. So it is actually connected and uh, we can't, you know, be attached from each other. We have actually to, to work with each other closely to even uh, when we are improving or developing our regulation and legislations, uh, Ministry of Health or the health entities or the health sector is one of the major stakeholders and the major entity or the major partner that has a potential impact on our regulation. So that is the first point. The second point, we speak about the green practices, not only in the health sector, but I would, if you allow me, let's take it from, you know, a broader perspective, like in every sector. We as human and as individual or as a corporate have to adopt sustainable lifestyle, sustainable consumption. Uh, if we are adopting or if we are actually following that, we wouldn't reach up to have those environmental problems or pollution. If we are really, you know, uh, implementing sustainable consumption. So uh, there are several practices, not only to be implemented in the health sector, but in, in, ev in every sector. Uh, when it comes to the waste, like for example, recycling the waste, producing it and reusing it, when it comes, you know, to using or uh, high efficiency energy and water appliances to have to reduce our energy and water uh, consumption, when it comes to our daily habits, you know, of, for example, transportation of, uh, uh, from, you know, uh, wasting, uh, for example, the food, you know, for example, food waste is one of the major uh, item in the food generation within not only UAE but I would say uh, around the world. So there are several practices that can be done in uh, every entity, not only in an, an, on a corporate level but also on an individual level to adapt such a sustainable consumption pattern. Thank you very much, Engineer Aisha. It was really interesting speech. Thank you. Now let's uh, call upon Ms. Uh, Agbal Kimda, the Vice Chancellor of the Learner Development, to present a token of appreciation to Engineer Aisha. Thank you.